Yes, so that is a good card from here on. Right. Uh, but I forgot to put it in my Okay, for those of you who are going to be watching the recording, the first 10 slides I've got. So if your recording starts here, do not be shocked. But you'll have this presentation that you can look through. Now, the more complex your study designs, the more complex the calculation, even though it's not too complex. And for analytic studies, which are studies from your epi, you know things like your case control study, your cohort study, your randomized control study, even your meta-analyses and so on, these are analytic studies. The, the randomized control trial being an experimental study. The, the approach is called a power analysis. And, because, and it's done that, it's called that because you have to take into account the ability to detect differences. So you will have a study, you'll have your hypotheses for your study, you have to have some knowledge of statistics to know how are you going to pick up these differences. Are you going to be performing Z-tests, T-tests, chi-square tests, tests for proportions, etc. You would have selected your population or subgroups based on your study hypothesis, based on your design. You would have to have some idea of what differences might exist between the groups some idea about standard deviations, know what error you're willing to live with, and how accurate or precise do you want your study to be. You also have to take into account how powerful your study should be. And you compute the sample sizes based on your calculations. As a rule, and by convention to there should be another set of quotations here. By convention, we set the, the confidence with which we want to state our results at 95%, or we say the probability of a type one error at alpha level is, point, is 5%. And by convention, we want our study to be powerful enough to have at least an 80% chance of picking up a difference when one truly exists. 80% power means ability to detect a difference, means that there's a 20% chance that you might miss it. Or we say beta equals 20% or 0.2. And you can always refer to the first slide for what is one minus beta, which is your power. Here's an example. We wish to compare two treatment regimens aimed at, and I'm modifying my slides as I'm going along and talking to you, aimed at comparing persons who get, let's say, radiotherapy for a certain cancer versus persons who do not. Under the current regime, regime persons who do not have 50% cure rate and make it better. While persons who are going to get this new therapy, the suggestion is that they will have a 70% Cure rate. What sample size will you be required in order to carry out this study and be able to pick up a difference and say that a big difference exists in the performance of the treatment therapy or therapies? We assume the usual 95% and alpha lever 5%, and there's a formula for calculating this. And it looks like this. It says, the sample size needed is a function of your z-score at the 95% confidence interval times square root that, 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 that. And there's a p-hat, a p-bar, and there's a p-1 for the, p sample, the proportions in group 1, and a p-2 for the proportions in group 2 all over the hypothesized difference. And there is P bar, here's how to say average. And if you work it out, work it out, work it, work it out, it will actually turn out to be 1.93. Now this Z value, one minus beta, which is your power, the statistic for doing for this is, when you go to your Z table, power 80%, the value is 0.842. So on your little note, 
you can just scribble above this 0.842. That's what it actually works out to. Z for alpha works out to be 1.96, and this works out to be 0 0.48, 0 0.842. And if you do it, you get the sample size. Similarly, if you want means, instead of comparing proportions, you wish to compare means. This time, let's say you're doing a cohort study, whether retrospective cohort or a prospective cohort. And here I've chosen a prospective cohort. You wish to compare the mean number of visits that asthmatics make in one from a certain area to asthmatics from another area. For example, Beverly Hills versus Riverton City. Or we could have talked about people who ride at Dover versus people who drive on the university campus. <coughs> how, how often do they come to x-rays due to fractures? <coughs> we could carry out this study, because it's a prospective home, home study, enroll the study on a, these people on a certain date, <coughs> and follow them for a year to see, one group for a year to see how many people come and what's the average visit rate. We do that, and we also need to get some idea of the standard deviations associated with whatever we are studying. I just went out and I created 2.4. And based on this, you would basically plug in the relevant pieces. Sorry, and one slide ahead. And for the mean, comparing means between two groups, this is the formula that is used. And if I went and I plugged in the data from the scenario that I presented, it would tell me that I need to study at least 25 per group. Right. This one is the most complex one, which is, suppose you're doing a case control study. You have to have some hypothesis. In this case, I'm looking at the relationship between hypertension and smoking. And it is thought that the risk of high blood pressure is greater among smokers than non-smokers. And smokers have about twice the risk of non-smokers. And how do I know this? Because I went and I did the literature review and the study suggested that the odds ratio is about two. We want to do a case control study to investigate the relationship between, say, smoking and hypertensive and non being hypertensive and being non hypertensive and being non hypertensive. Now we are doing a case control study. So the cases are the hypertensive and the non hypertensive, which are the control but the cases. And the risk factor or the exposure is the smoking. Using that estimated odds ratio from the literature, we can actually estimate what proportion of the smokers will exist among the cases. That is among the hypertensives. And based on these calculations and the smoking rate among people who are not hypertensive, based on the literature, and this is why we tell people you have to do your literature review. What is the sample size that will be needed? All right, there's a formula for doing that. And the formula looks something like this. N equals what about P1 and P2 and P star, which you can follow. But the key is, from the literature, we need to know the odds ratio. And we'll need to know what we call, like, what's the background? What is the general smoking rate among everybody else? These are the controls or the general population. We can estimate based on this and odds ratios. And there's a formula for converting odds to probabilities or proportions, which is what this formula is. And we put that in and we get P star 1, the proportion of hypertensives who smoke. And we plug these in into the formula. Here I did it based on the data, and that turned out to be an expected ratio of 46% smoking 
among the at-risk group compared to 30% which are among the not, the not at-risk group, which are the so-called cases, are the people smoking among the controls versus the rates of smoking among the cases. And I put these in and put them in a wonderful grand formula and I will get that what I need to study is 130 per group. So I need to get 130 people who are hypertensive and I need 130 people who are not hypertensive and then ask them about smoking. And I should be able to pick up differences. So that at first looks very awesome and very terrible. But as I said, this is just the background theory. I'm going to show you some shortcuts shortly. But to use the shortcuts, you kind of need just to have some idea of what's going on. So with these formulae, I will tell you that this is what we would normally do in the days when there were no computers. Sit down and manually count. <laughs> A couple of things before we go to the computer era. And this is about adjustments. Suppose when you work out things, for example, in this slide, when we were talking about when we were doing a cross-sectional study, we needed to study um, 384 people. This was the purpose about reproductive age couple. We needed to study 384 people. Suppose the population you're studying is even 384. What do you do? All right. There is a formula to do some adjustment. And this is what we call the adjustment factor, and it's a complete formula. And it says you need to adjust your original sample size by, by this factor. I'm not going to go into the details of the calculation of the factor. But what you see, some n's, n is the size of this finite population. Big N is the size that was calculated using those original formula. And the adjusted sample size is equal to this. And to exemplify this, I just give this example. Earlier when we calculated, we calculated that we needed 384 people in our sample. But let us say we are studying a very small island and there are only 100 people on this island. You can't get 384. So what do you have to do? We use this adjustment. Say N adjusted equals that and we apply the factor. And here, 384 over 1 minus 384 divided by 100, N which is the finite population. And we'll notice that we would need to study 80 people out of 100. <laughs> All right, if you have a finite population, because sometimes you, the fact size you require, you don't even have that many people. Aha! Uh -huh. Now I'm going to make the population even smaller. Say that the island has only 50 people. If you use this adjustment formula, you'll end up having to study 44. Which is why when your sample size, when your population is small, people say, the effort to study 44 and go and sample and randomly choose among the 44, study all 50. Just go and study the 50. So when the populations are small, we don't do sampling, we just do a census. If you have only 50 children with glioblastoma multiforme on CT scan or MRI. There's no point in going to sample. Just do the 50 children and done. At which point you save yourself also a lot of things from ethics committee because you say a, a census will be done. Hey, Amen. Nobody can argue with you. But this is what you this is how you'd approach it. All right. Now, rather than work through all these formally, there are lots of websites that can help you with the sample calculation. 
<laughs> but the websites are of no use unless you know what your study design, what is the parameter like, what is your objective, and the precision and confidence with which you want to state results. So if you don't know those, these sites are useless. So one such site is, this one is used for hyperlink, hyperlink open. This is a common site, and I must take credit for having introduced it. And copied it and found it and gave it to him. But everybody kind of uses it. No. The raw site. And you notice this formula here that they give you at the formula? This is the fancy formula that I gave you. N equals that, 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 that. They're just telling you how, what the formula they are using. So it asks you what margin of error are you willing to accept? Let's say that you wish to accept to estimate the proportion of something. The proportion of mothers who have abnormal, who have bone abnormalities on x-ray at 36 weeks. Ah, mothers with fetuses. All right, or fetuses with abnormality. You say what error you want, meaning what error you're willing to accept. You know, this they put in 5% because it's the default. But you could always change this to 1% or 0.1%. <coughs> now, if you change it to 10%, you will get a sample size. But when you publish your study results, journals will not accept it. Because they say, what kind of study is this when there's a 10% chance that all these findings could be wrong? Or the error margin is so wide. So we generally tell you, do not try to make your errors greater than 5%. What confidence level do you need? We always like to report at 90%. But I'll show you a little thing. You can choose to report at 90%, but you run your own risk at that. Or 80%. Or you may choose to report your results with 30% confidence. Which people would say, go away from yourself. <laughs> you imagine you come to me, Minister, I am 30% confident that this is the situation that you and expect him to make a policy decision. <laughs> yeah. So, sometimes they ask you what is the population size. If you know it, you put it in. If you know the entire population size. So, for example, if you are studying all patients attending U UWI within the last 12 months, and you know that these are 800 patients, you put 800 in there. If you don't know the population size, it, we say assume it is large. And in statistics, when we say large, it's about 10,000, 20,000. So you just leave it in if you don't know. And then you, the response distribution is what you estimate the proportion to be. So for example, if you think 20% of people are going to have fetal abnormalities, on x-ray, you put in 20%, 20, zero, 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 right. And then immediately tells you, you need to study 242. If you expect only 10%, um, that's this, 10%, you only need to study 138. If you estimate only 5% will have an abnormality, or 4%, you only need to study 59 people. It turns out that 4% abnormal means 95% normal, 96% normal. So what happens in proportions is that I could have changed my research question and, changed and said, hey, rather than than saying I think that 4% is abnormal, I could have said I think 96% is normal. And it should give me the same sample size. And if you do it, that it does give you the same. And the important message I want to make here take, for you to take home is that sample size is going to be largest when the proportion is around 50% or close to 50. So if I put in 50%, of it is going to be abnormal, I need to study 377 people. 
as opposed to 4%. So in general, when you're doing your literature review, if you're a semi-lazy person, you hope your literature review has smaller percentages and not percentages like 48 and 52, which are close to 50, those are going to require larger sample sizes. But Shiojian said the survey in your department is nothing. <laughs> this site also gives you <coughs> what confidence you'd have if you change your sample size, just as a rough idea. So if you wanted to be 99% confident in your results, you'd need to study 642 people. Well, for me as a student and a resident, what sample size do you wish to study? 377 at 95% or go for the 99 with 642? Well, you know, you, you have to decide. Some people are very rich. Some people want to spend a long time in their program. They can choose appropriately. Of course, you notice the less confident you are, the smaller the sample size. You could also actually say, suppose I studied only 100 people in this scenario. The error would be 9%. And you might say, no, that's not really acceptable. So this site just also gives you some scenarios to play with so you can make some decisions. All right, that's Rawsoft. That's one site. And uh, minimize. Here's my perfect um, yellow. Um, and then go back to my presentation PowerPoint. Just another site, um, hyperlink open. This one is a site for comparing two independent samples. So, for example, if you want to compare the proportion of boys seen at UA with genu valgus versus girls, we get the population of girls, we get the population of boys. We go to our literature or we do our small pilot study, we know the proportions that we estimate. And I'm going to say, let's say that the proportion of boys with knock knees are 20%. Are 30%, and actually for this site, you have to put in 0.3 rather than 30%. And the proportion of girls are 0.2 or 20%. We want our error to be 5%, and we want our study to be powerful enough to have an 80% chance to pick up a difference, but difference exists between boys and girls on this proportion. You notice all of the sites will say default is this because they know that's the general accepted. We then hit calculate. And it tells me that in order to do this study, I need to study 294 boys and 294 girls in order to pick up a 10% gap. Of course, if the prevalence of boys was 0.6. Uh, let's change it to 0.6. And among girls, 0.2. And I hit calculate. I only need to study 23. Because the difference is so vast that I can easily pick it up. You know, a 40% difference between girls and boys exists. I don't need many people in order to establish that difference. So you can play around and based on your literature, do that. All right. Um, another site, and I'm gonna just this one. I won't demonstrate all the things, but I'm gonna just open it to show you what's out there. This is another site where you can get lots of stuff, and you can decide what do you want to do. Sound precise. And what do you want to do? Sample size or proportions, unmatched case control study, cohort study, establishing differences. And I would just click on what I want and I would go enter and it will ask me what confidence level I want to report, 
what power I want, and I can change all of these. The ratio of the sample size group one and two, one to one, or is one group twice as large? And if I'm doing means, this is what I, I put in the mean of group one, the mean of group two, the standard deviation of group one, the standard deviation, and run whatever I want. If I'm doing something else, proportions, I do the same thing. If it's just a single proportion, I would put in this, and the anticipated or expected result, put in, and you go. This has lots of things that you can do. Another sample size, sample, another site. This one, I'm not gonna click on it because sometimes it's until the end, I'll try it. This one is from the obstetrics department of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. It has a whole statistical toolbox available. And if, you know, you can search for the subject. So if you're doing sample size, you look on the S, and you see the menu and you choose. Other interesting sites include this one, DSSS, which I don't particularly like because it tends to be a little bit not as accurate as the other sites. But you would go here to resources and you go to calculators and it says, what do you want? Some precise calculator for, for comparing means, for comparing percentages, you can even determine the power of your study. Let's say I'm comparing means. And here I'm comparing one sample or two samples. Make up two samples. And somebody now tell me what is the average crown rum length at six months. Just tell me. You do this every day? Or at three months, anything that you feel. Um, 25, he says 25 centimeters. So I'm gonna put in sample one, crown lump length among um, women take women who use a particular chemical it at birth um, during pregnancy, 30, 30 percent, 30 centimeters or millimeters. Sample two, people who didn't use this chemical, 25 or 35. I put that in. From the literature, I would have got my standard deviations. Say it's three for sample one, and it's one or 1.2 for sample two. I can break up some figures. The alpha lever is 1.2. The power, you want 80% power. Here it has 50%, you just click down. And you can set the power at 80% or beat at 20%. And then you just calculate some precise. And this tells me the difference is so large with power 20%. Let me see, 20% beta. And this side is a little bit ambiguous about beta. And it says that difference is so large, 25 um 35 ver oh 35 versus 30 such a big difference that i only need three p three <laughs> but that was just made up that's not realistic mm -hmm. but it will do it and it's another site that you can visit i like the other sites better because this this one has its own litter here is a resource um and this one, samprecise.net. Again, it's a candy from a baby. You go in and you choose your study design. Descriptive study, two group study, one group study, cluster study. What do you wish to compare, beans or proportions? And you go through and say what you want and calculate anything that you want. So if I'm comparing groups and I'm comparing means, I hit on mean, some precise mean, and it tells me to fill in these things. If I'm comparing proportions, 
it will ask me what are the proportions in group one, group two, and so on and so forth. And you can get, if I'm doing correlations and sample size, it will give you a what and what do you know the correlation coefficient to be. So there it is, another site. And then the final site that I put on this, it's not necessarily, it has some sample size calculation, but it's a very good site just for statistics. And so this site, statspage.org, I'm going to just do two, this one. <coughs> this is a site. This is not what the class is about, but sorry. And I'm saying I'm in a class. Okay, man. Um, this is a, 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 a site um, that allows you to do lots of things. Many people often end up with a two by two table and you can do all kinds of things with it. You know, once you have your data, just showing you, you can perform chi-square tests. You can do sensitivity, specificity, kappa relative risk, anything. You just put in some numbers and everything is generated. Um, so for example, if I'm doing comparing KPH, don't worry about positive and negative. This is, you can just put in the words KPH and UE, and I put 21 here, whatever I'm studying, and 45 here. And here I put 151, and I put um, 200 here. And then I say calculate, I'm just going to just hit calculate, compute. Depending on what I want to compute, it will do all kinds of things and give you all kinds of results. Odds ratios, sensitivity, specificity, if that's what, chi-square values, p-values. What's the site for you? That's the one that says um, useful statistics page. And on this general statistics page, in case one day you run into a lot of problems and you don't know what to do, and you need a page to do a calculation for you, these are sites. What do you want? Choose anything, calculators, plotters, probability, da 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 descriptive statistics, Instagram, da 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 And all of these are places where you can go to get that done. Provided you have the data and you know what you want. It's a long, 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 long list. So it's there for everybody to find whatever they want. And so the final two slides that I have is just to say, how do you write it up? Because this is also a problem that we no, find among our students, right? <laughs> When you're doing so your thing to ethics and you're justifying the sample size, depending on what you want to do. So here's my thing. Previous studies, light al, full idiot and dummy. Estimate the prevalence of whatever you're studying in Caribbean countries to be about 20%. Assuming this figure and the blah, 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 the minimum sample size is that. CWW for the sample size calculator that you use online. Another one might be a different kind of study where you wish to study. It should come up in a second. Right. Where you wish to study, let's say, comparisons between groups, or you are looking at effects. This one is, say, for example, a randomized controlled study where you think, for example, a 10% reduction in your A1C on this new therapy is a good thing. And you want, and you say that's clinically significant. Or you could say a 20% increase in bone density, having fed yourself on calcitonin or whatever it is, or calcium supplements, would be considered significant. You'd look at rates of disease in one group versus another group getting calcium supplements versus the group not getting 64 in one group. 75. And with a power of 0.8 or 80%, it will tell you that in this study, in order to pick up that difference, you would need 335 per group. 
And here's the calculator that I use to plug in this figure. 10% difference, group one percentage, group two percentage, power 80%, 95% um, confidence interval, or we say 5% uncertainty, or, or um, alpha, type one alpha error. And you basically do that. The rest of the slides I haven't really put there for you, but just in case any of you go off into animal studies where you're playing around with radiation and you want to radiate some rats and see what happens, there, there's a formula for actually helping you to calculate how much rats you need in how much group. Okay. And so the preferred method is to do what we, are, what we just did. But otherwise, there's this method which you can read on these slides that you say, you know, based on this thing on a paper produced by Altman and Festing, there's a way to calculate your sample size and I've listed it in there in case. But this, I don't expect you all to be working on rats and rabbits. So that's because I teach some of the basic med people and I have to tell them how much rats they need to get. <laughs> but you basically will stay in there. So that's, in essence, what you <laughs> will do. So probably just to concretize it, yeah, you said we have two people who are trying to work on their sample size. All right, or anybody else? Yes. But, but, but you, from what you remember, he's doing a what kind of study, a cross-sectional study? What well, the, the, the statistician actually advises him to do was to do a census. A census? Oh, yeah. he does have a problem. Because I told him that was fine. That was absolutely fine. Um, when, whenever you get the chance to do a census, it means the gods have smiled at me. So why do you unmute? Stefan, I'm trying to unmute you. You want to share? Hi, hi. Yes. Afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So my study was um, basically the clinical and radiological characteristics of renal calculi in our hospital. Yes. So. Uh, what I wanted to do was get the proper size for our catalog area instead what, of the. What do you want? Sorry, you repeat that again? Um, right, so I'm in Trinidad, right? So I wanted to get the sample size for our catchment area instead of the entire population because only a certain number of people come to our hospital based on the regions. So, so, what are you aiming at? Are you trying to get the proportion of people who present or are detected with renal calculi? Or are you trying to measure the mean length of the mean and calculate, see that X-ray? What, what, what is it that you're actually trying to do? Right. The former of what you said? The so, proportion of people from the population who present it renal calculate. Correct. All right. So what you are really doing is you're trying to estimate proportions. Right. And this is a cross-sectional study, I take it to be. Right. Because, yeah, and it has to be because yeah. you're just taking a group of people who came to X-ray and you're estimating the proportion. Now, there are two things with that study that you have to be careful about. Okay. The first is, are you estimating the proportion of those who were X-rayed presenting with renal calculus? which is very different from the proportion of the population who have renal calculi. I suspect it's the first. Yes, like we're looking at all the people who presented to the radiography department or the radiology department okay. during a certain year at a certain hospital. Yes. And you're estimating that. Okay. So what you will need is the proportion of persons the population will be the size of the persons who go to the radiology department and who do certain kinds of x-rays. And are you doing people just come for x-rays or people who come for a particular kind of x-rays? A particular kind of, it's not x-rays, it's CT, so it's a particular... Right. A particular kind of CT. Correct. So, so what you'll be doing is you'll be going to your records and you see all the population who came for that CD. CT. Yeah. 
And we would do, what we would do is that we would go to Rao Soft because your study is about proportions. And let me just open this. And you would say margin of error 5%. 95% confidence, because that's what we would like. You would then get here, where I have 20,000. You get the population who have presented for CTs for that purpose. So let's say that in a year you had 230 persons. Mm -hmm. I'm making up that, 239. You should have read the literature, which estimate the proportion of such persons who in former studies have been found to have renal calculus? Let's say it's 20%. We would put in 20 here. Right. And it will tell us you need to study 122 people. Let's say that you don't know anything or you really want the maximum sample size um, that would cover everything and make sure you're all right you'll put in 50%. And it will tell you that you need to study at least 146 in order for you to, be, to make sure you cover everything. Assuming there are only 239 such cases. So the important thing, however, is that a lot of people can be lazy and just say, just put in 50% because it covers. But it's real ethics committee will not necessarily want that. Because one, it's a waste of your time or your resources if you could only study 75 and get your results. Sure. You know, so what they want you to do is do the literature review, do the stuff so that you can get the most appropriate sample size given what you've told. Now, you may also have studied literature and you may have seen a study from Jamaica that said 20%. You may have seen one from the US that says 50%, or one from Saudi Arabia that says 46%. You might say, let's this is your entry in that, so I'm gonna choose Jamaica. Or you might have seen this in a number of countries across the Caribbean. St. Martin, 80%, St. Lucia, 25%, Jamaica, 17%, um, Cayman, 25%. And choose one more, um, Grenada, 15%. Now you are saying, which one should I use? One approach is to say, when you have a number of very similar countries, you can say reported prevalence ranges from 15 to 20%, an average of about 18. And then you put 18 in your sample size. That's one way. If you've got many that you can't really decide, which one to do. So given that approach, you know what you want and how to calculate your sample size. But notice here, the key thing is that you have to be absolutely sure of what your major objective is and what you wish to establish for your study. Now, when you write your study, it is not unusual to have more than one objective. You have to decide which one is the critical objective? Which one, if not answered, my study would not be worth it? Or which of the two, if there are more than two that you must answer, then you have to do the calculations using objective one, and another calculation using objective two, and see which one gives you the bigger sample size so that you, everybody will be covered. So that is, you know, that's why it's so crucial that research protocol that identifies your study question and your study objectives, because that is what your sample size calculation will be determined by, and then the supporting literature. Thank you. All right. Yes. So. I'll, I'll sign off with the guy. Yes, you'll sign off. So thank you very much for entertaining me. Thank you, thank you very very much. Thank you. Bye guys. So I'll send the, the PowerPoint to you all. Okay. All right. Dr. Sarah. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Bye. 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 <laughs>
Sorry. Um, Dr. Sarah, sorry. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's Wasti. Uh, I just wanted to run, um, I don't know if you have like two minutes to spare, if I could just run my topic by you. I grab and go. I'm having another day. I'm going to remind you for another class. All right. Um, so let me just pull this off so you can get to it. Oh, well. No, but it's there. I just need to see it. Yes, you can see it. Now, because I have to I'm just trying to save this thing in there so he can. Uh, I am not a I'm not a previous No, but just close it. Just close it. Those are. Which one no, is the close. Which one is the PowerPoint? Just close. Just close. I can always get it off. It's on this. Which right. one is the PowerPoint? And then go January 20th. Just drag it. Just drag it. Okay. No, no. Okay. 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 <laughs> no, just jump right. We need to make sure that it just turn itself off. Oh, so, I yank. I, I'm a yanker. Hey, what's up? Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Happy, Happy New, 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 New Year. Year, I tell you. Yeah. No, man, you don't worry about me. No. I will yank. What? My jump drives are very resilient. Uh, uh, <laughs> all right, take it right. Thank you very much. Yes, I will. Mean, <laughs> Hi, Dr. Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I changed my topic. I know you had reviewed my initial case, but um, my sample size was going to be an issue, and I basically changed my topic now, right? So my new topic uh, in, in Mount Hope, so I'm from Mount Hope in Trinidad, and Eric Williams Medical, we don't actually have a program in place for thrombolysis, IV thrombolysis of patients who have acute MC territory infarction with an aspect greater than seven, right? So the thing is, I, I wanted to do sort of like a, I guess a prospective study might be the better study to go with um, for like basically looking at the proportion of the patients who have MC territory infarction that has an aspect greater than seven, an aspect score greater than seven. To pretty much see how best like we could try to use those results to implement a program more or less in our hospital. No, 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 Mm -hmm. Somebody, oh, Swasti, go again. I missed it <laughs> on top of what you said because there's a lot of here on here. That's okay. Sorry. Uh, I'm really sorry to keep you back. Um, well, so, we were going to end up, you're going to have to email me because I'm not here. I already saying I've been up from four o'clock this morning. So, oh, you want, me, you want me to email you a copy of what I'm going to do then? I suppose you could, and I can give you an opinion if I have any. Okay. <laughs> All right. No problem. Well, I'll send it to you this week. Uh, All right. But and, and just for a little feedback of advice as to the direction, make sure I'm going on a good one, right? All right, and of course, I'll talk to um, Dr. Robertson. Okay, great. Thank All you. Right. Bye. All right. Bye. Everybody, it's okay. They're going to leave you. Yeah. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Good. <I'm> <laughs> Have a good evening. Bye. Bye. It was a really good lecture. He's an excellent teacher. He's excellent, yeah.